So I know I probably wouldn't do this, but I kind of have to do this particular review. So what happened was I um, read this book just recently, I finished reading it, called The Unincorporated War by Danny Cole and Aiton Coleman. And it's a sequel to another book I read back in summer called The Unincorporated Man. And um, the premise of this series is about this um, genius billionaire named Justin Cord, who cryogenically frees himself because he has cancer, and he tries to wake up in a time <clears throat> in which he hopes that cancer can cure. And it is. But the consequence is that he wakes into a society which has totally different societal norms in his own. And one of those norms, most shocking, that kind of defines our society is called incorporation. And the idea is that every individual person, when they're born, is formed into a legal corporation. The government owns part of people, and your parents own part of people when you're born. But the idea is people can literally buy and sell stock of people. Um, it's never actually seen as slavery, though. They believe it is simply an extension of Western capitalism. But it's this very fascinating premise. And uh, Justin Cord, when he comes out of the suspension unit, uh, he is not incorporated because he wasn't born in that time. So he actually goes into a, a long legal battle with the government. And The Unincorporated Man, the first book in the series, is all about that legal battle. <clears throat> now, I really enjoyed this. It's just, this is actually a debut novel. So for a debut novel, it's an excellent book. I thought um, that what really fascinating about me is not just the premise, but the incredibly balanced take they do on it. So basically, <clears throat> this book could be read as, in many ways, kind of pro-capitalist or anti-capitalist. I don't think it's, I think it's actually, it's very nuanced of how it works, because uh, they don't always portray incorporation and the future society as being bad. They actually explain it has a lot of benefits. So, for instance, um, one of the main reasons it exists is because the idea is that if someone's incorporated and you invest in that person, you have a financial incentive that makes sure they do well in life. And so, as a result, poverty in the future, as we understand it today, has been limited. And their poverty is like laughable. Their poverty simply means you don't have quite as much luxury as the richest people in the world. And as a result, sometimes you don't even feel bad for people who are actually trying to instigate this revolution. On the other hand, though, they do show, I mean, ultimately, philosophically, they explain that incorporation is not a good idea. It's holding humanity back and uh, basically was kind of slowly forcing people into slavery, but they make a very good case for the counterpoint. And it's not really an anti-capitalist novel either, but it's also not a pro-capitalist novel because they explain that Justin Cord, who's, you know, a billionaire, simply believes that people's right to own property extends to owning themselves. So it has, so people, I've heard people describe this as being a libertarian book, but I disagree. I think it's actually very, I don't think it describes a particular ideology, it's just a very overall balanced book. I think it's, well, it, it might be fair to say that it supports capitalism, but it does so in a very balanced take. And when it criticizes capitalism, it does so in a very adult way. Like definitely not from a kind of like teenage dystopian fiction kind of sort of thing, where it's all about, you know, <clears throat> a young teenager's parents being in charge, and they're the villains, and they're ruining the environment. It's a very balanced take, and, I'd, and that's what fascinated me most about this book. Also, the world itself is very well developed. I mean, not only is it premise industry, but they go into a lot of detail with different corporations, different laws, social norms. There's more to this world than just corporations. There's lots of uh, interesting traditions and the uh, backstory. It kind of reminds me, in some ways, a little bit of Dune in this regard, because Dune has a main plot about, you know, bringing life to a desert planet, but there's also more backstory things that inform what happens in the book, like, for instance, uh, <clears throat> machines being banned. But, um... In this book, they actually even have a similar thing, and they've actually banned uh, artificial reality. And that's a whole backstory thing. I won't get too much into the spoilers, but uh, interesting thing that sort of informs the character's decisions at different points. It's also a very racially diverse book. It's actually kind of it's subtle. Like, you won't notice that much at first. When you look back, I realize a lot of the characters are actually very racially diverse. Y'all think you should make a point of this. In the future society, like, humankind is very heterogeneous. <clears throat> But it all just sort of works out. Like, you've got many men and many women in different positions of power. You've got different races. And you can tell people what it, having, like, different sign names. It's uh, very racially and ethnically diverse. And it's an interesting decision. And I like how it's executed. But I do have some problems with this book. Uh, but the main problem by far, and I'm willing to figure this somewhat because it's a classic sci-fi book. And classic sci-fi books are notorious for having this problem. Is that the characters are really badly written. Well, not, not, I think they're basically serviceable. But the thing is, they're very one-dimensional, and that's a problem that classic sci-fi is known for having. Uh, they basically, they're actually kind of cheesy, to be honest. My favorite by far is definitely the villain, who I thought was actually, so he's kind of one-dimensional, but he has this very charismatic personality. You understand why people like him so much. He's very, like, a, he's used interesting rhetorical techniques to get people to listen to him and persuade him. I just thought it, I just thought it actually made him a very interesting character. But apart from that, the characters in this book are very boring and 
But I am willing to forgive it somewhat because that's just the nature of a classic sci-fi book. All the ma main thing of the book is it's not really character driven so much as plot driven. It's actually has a very uh, fast moving but like multi level layer plot. There's many different different layers actually that the plot kind of goes on, different perspectives and people influencing events. It's very interesting to follow in that regard. I do have a few world building issues though. Uh, so it's a very world of a world, but there are some things that are not really adequately explained. Like one of the problems in the world is that um, so in the future world, they actually are terrified that you have taxes because they believe there's such a pro-capitalist society that they believe that you know taxes are theft and all that. But the weird thing is, is that the government, when you're born, actually owns five percent of you, and you can't buy that five percent back like you can the five percent parent. I mean the twenty percent your parents own. <clears throat> And the reason the government owns this is so they can pay for internal improvements and infrastructure and things like that. And that is exactly the same reason taxes exist in real life. And they serve exactly the same function as taxes. And they operate in exactly the same way as taxes. So I don't understand why they're so averse to taxes. They just are taxes. This 5% the government owns of you is a tax. <clears throat> in fact, you could argue maybe it's even more pressing than a regular tax. <clears throat> it's just a very strange thing that they don't really explain adequately. Another thing... And this is actually more important for the second book, The Uncorporated War. But they mentioned briefly that uh, one of the, the biggest corporations, GCI, they mentioned them having mercenaries. But the world in the future is a unified solar system. <clears throat> and they mentioned war has been a thing of the past. So I can imagine there being private security companies, but they seem to imply the mercenary companies actually fight each other. As in, like, fight other corporations. But that's not supposed to be allowed? It's very, it's not really adequately explained, but I wouldn't say it's a big, but it's kind of like, Mentioned like kind of like once or twice in, in this book. But anyway, overall, I give The Unincorporated Man a 4.5 out of 5 stars. It's an excellent debut novel. Classic sci fi is kind of an acquired taste. If you don't like the fact that it's very, very, very one dimensional characters, then I would not recommend picking it up. But if you do like the uh, interesting world premise, uh, the very balanced take on the capitalism issue, and also the erasing diverse setting, then I think that you should uh, give it a shot. The second book, The Unincorporated War, I think it kept up the quality pretty well, but I did not like as much as the first book. So, <clears throat> what's kind of shocking, in case, well, in case you haven't, can't tell, a war breaks out in this one. I'm not going to get into details as to why it happens. But what happens is they actually shift the focus away from the main characters in the previous book to a new set of characters. The main characters are still there, and at first it seems like they're the main characters, but over time you realize they're actually no longer the focus. <clears throat> now, this is kind of jarring, I'm not going to lie, because... It feels at times like the main characters in the previous book should still be the focus, but they just aren't, and the new ones are. But I don't mind, because the new characters are actually a bit more interesting. They're still kind of largely one-dimensional, but they've got more traits and personalities and like that. That I just kind of find uh, more interesting to read about. Like, <clears throat> another thing is, so they have the opposing side in this war, which I'm not going to say what it is. But the opposing side from the main characters is actually portrayed in a very balanced light. Like, they never portray the people in it as being, well, most of them at least, just a high command. But this is actually like soldiers and a lot of the generals, they're not evil people. They're actually pretty conscientious people. And they're trying to do the job and they're very competent soldiers. So I like that aspect of it as well. <clears throat> it's actually even more racially diverse than the first one, believe it or not, because they introduce uh, religious groups, actually, which is something they don't mention at all in the first book. <clears throat> but the idea, in, but in the second book, I'd say it's actually more racially diverse. It's actually a bit more clear about being racially diverse as well. But uh, I guess never shoved in your face, so to speak. But I was I very like I very much like it. There's a lot of different cultures and different like races and nationalities are presented in this in the uh, far future, and it's very interesting that the Cullen brothers are committed to doing this. Also, the villain from the previous book I still think is excellent. He just didn't have quite as big a role. He's still very charismatic. I'm curious to see what he'll be doing in the next book in the series. Well, although I won't be reading that probably work for a while. However, one thing my the least favorite thing out of this particular book I had was the people. It's actually way cheesier than the first book. And the first book was pretty cheesy with the one-dimensional characters, but the second book, you see, has this thing, <clears throat> basically every single time that the main character does something, everyone is trying to protect him, and they're extremely loyal to him, and then, and the question is orders, but that's always for the most good-natured reasons, and just, it's like extremely cheesy, and just really annoys me, because it just, like, you can predict everyone's actions. Like, it's one of those things where, like, uh, the main character would be like, Okay, I'm going to do this extremely daring move. And everyone's like, no, 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 no. We'll do it for you. We need to sacrifice ourselves. You need to be safe or whatever. And it's just, it's really, really, really cheesy how it works like that. Also, more world building issues with this than the previous book. So the thing is, this war breaks out in a society that was for like hundreds of years completely peaceful. And the mercenary companies they mentioned briefly in the first book, 
they're more important than they start taking on jobs in the second book, but they never explain what they were actually doing before the war broke out. Like, I, I mean, private security, maybe, but certainly not in the scale of warfare, and I just, I cannot even believe it. Like, oh, not to mention that, they also go to things like, so they have, like, a standard sci-fi technology, like spaceships, and uh, they have, like, rail guns, like laser guns, <clears throat> stuff like that, but they never explain really how they developed it, or not even that much how it works, and it's kind of just the reader sort of ex accept it for what it is, because it's a sci-fi a military um, space opera. Actually, it's a big difference in the previous book. The previous book feels like an entirely different genre. It was more like a political thriller in a sense. And the second book is actually like a military sci-fi book. And they actually like battles and tactics are very interesting to read about. But I thought it was bewildering how they never really explained how the society, which was totally peaceful for a long time, was able to adapt so quickly to being at war. Like, I, I can't even believe that. Even over the space of a couple of years, it's mind-boggling to me. And they don't adequately explain what the military technology and stuff does. <clears throat> and um, still, I did enjoy the second book, but also, um, I won't be reading the third book for a long time as I'm trying to go through my books on my shelf, but uh, it ends, the second book ends in a very daring, bold way that I actually had spoiled for me, but I respect it a lot for doing that, but it's a very risky move that the authors have taken, and I'm not sure how they're going to go, how well they're going to execute it in the future. But I give the second book a 4 out of 5 stars, and like it quite as much as the first book, <clears throat> but I am curious to see where this series is going, and hopefully it maintains quality. Anyway, um, thanks for watching. Be sure to uh, please YouTube algorithm gods by liking, commenting, and subscribing, and uh, have a nice day.